What do you like as a CEO? I'm definitely a person that's forward thinking, but smart enough to know that I should have people that are smarter than me around me. What is fan base? It's built for the centennial generation. It's a space and a place for people to build their own universe. Has that been a value to you, that name? Being my father's son definitely gave me a perspective of success and failure at a very high level. Talk to me a little bit about Atlanta. It's the city that for African-American people should be the most protected and defended municipality in the world. I literally never want to live anywhere else. They're all number two. Hey family, it's Carlos Watson. I've got a special one for you. Isaac Hayes III, that's right, the son of the legendary soul singer, stopping by. He may be one of the most interesting entrepreneurs in the country right now, building something amazing called Fanbase. If you haven't heard about it, tune in. You're going to be happy you did. Isaac, how you doing? Good. I'm ready for COVID to be gone. <laughs> right. But now I hear you guys down in Atlanta. I heard you guys just decided a year and a half ago COVID didn't exist. And you guys have just been doing your thing the whole time. Everybody else has. Georgia reported 3,700 new cases of COVID. I've been inside. <laughs> have you? Okay. It was good for me because I was able to work. And yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure everybody got COVID or got the vaccine. Are you someone who prefers to be at home? You prefer to be out? I'm both. It could definitely be like uh, the life of the party. Like I'm either everywhere or nowhere. That's kind of my personality. So I'm in my dream right now. There's no place I'd rather be than this building right now. It doesn't matter. So I'm totally fine either way. Isaac, talk to me about the name and uh, about the heritage, because when I thought about it, Isaac Hayes is a great name. I mean, obviously, you know, all respect to your pop, but it's such a great name. And then there's something about the third where there's something beautiful about that. Has that been a value to you, uh, that name? And, and how's it played out for you in your life, being Isaac Hayes and Isaac Hayes the third at that? Being my father's son definitely gave me a perspective of success and failure at a very high level. So I don't take any of this for granted. It is not anything that I feel like I deserve um, by birthright, you know what I mean? You have to really, really work hard. My father was an extremely hard worker and I get that from him. It's funny seeing you talk and even the way you tilt your head a little bit. And I can see him now wearing those glasses he used to wear sometimes and just the way he would tilt his head a little bit. But for those who don't know, if you don't mind, remind people because you said the centennial generation is coming new to a lot of stuff. My father was a famous soul singer by the name of Isaac Hayes from Memphis, Tennessee. Who's the black private dick that's a sex machine to all the cheeks? Damn right. Went from learning to play the piano with two fingers to winning an Oscar by, you know, his early 30s. Isaac Hayes, theme from Shaq. The first African-American man to win an Academy Award for musical composition, who started out as a songwriter at Stax Records and went on to be the number one artist at the label. Black man, born free. At least that's the way it's supposed to be. I think he's probably one of the most innovative and influential artists in black culture and hip hop, because I think modern day style and fashion and energy all comes from Isaac Hayes. This is a man who was shirtless with gold chains on and sunglasses with a bald head and a very nappy beard and really merging two genres of music, a very pop, Motown sound with a very soulful, hard, aggressive bottom. And so what was it like having a famous father? It is just like having your mom and dad. The difference that other people probably don't have is the effect that their parent had on the world as a person when you're out in public with them. But at home, it's the same thing. It's discipline. It's do your homework, brush your teeth, mow the lawn. I got whoopings as a kid. You know what I mean? It's the same. Did your dad have as much time and was he interested in giving time? Like, what's that dynamic like? I think my dad taught me more about the music business than actually being a musician because those were the mistakes that he made. And I was a musician and a producer and still am at heart. And I had success in the music industry, but one of the things that I think I had the freedom of, of doing is the choice to try something different. I didn't have to be my father to be great, but I would be great because of my father. I'd be great because of the intangibles, the work ethic, the passion, the love of what he does. And so as a creator, being able to build a tech startup 
and an app is something far different than what my dad would ever do, but it's the same energy behind it. So I think if he were here now, he would be enormously impressed and surprised that his son decided to take this journey um, and, and be completely happy with what's going on. Is that the fan base studio you in right now, the offices? It was different the last time. The last time we was at the old office, but yeah. this is a new office down here at ATL. This is a black founded Atlanta startup. We just got named um, 22 startups to watch in 2022. Now, why do you say you're living your dream? Because I love it when I hear people are uh, doing something that excites them. Everything that like right here where I am right now was an idea in my head a few years ago. And now, you know, got 40 plus people working on a tech startup that didn't exist in, in you know, a few years ago. So, I mean, that's that's grateful. I'm like, I don't I don't have to go anywhere. I'm excited to get up and work on this and build this every day, so. What was the most important thing for actually getting you started? Because you know so many people get stopped at the idea phase. They have these ideas, they're in their heart, they're in their head, but it never quite transitions into being a real thing. When you look back, like what actually was that moment where you guys became a real thing. I think the introduction to my now CTO, as soon as we met, it was like magic. And I think that changed everything because I actually had someone that worked, you know, just as hard as I did to actuate um, the vision. And we did a great job with it. And so it was, you know, enormous blessing that I met him. And then from that moment on, we've been building fan base together since mid 2018. And what are you like as a CEO, as a leader? Do you have that ability to look from the outside and kind of like evaluate yourself as almost as if it wasn't you? I'm definitely um, a person that's forward thinking, but I'm smart enough to know that I should have people that are smarter than me around me. A facilitator of ideas is kind of what I am. I come from the music industry as a producer, and so you can be a phenomenal producer, but also know how to facilitate amazing musicians and songwriters and have those entities work together to create great music. And um, working with fan base is, is no different. I just have to have, you know, amazing talent around and then they go to work. So I think I'm very passionate about what we do, but I'm also um, thinking about all the time, like how can we be better? And how can I be better? And I think that's one thing that's important as a CEO is don't try to do everything. Where you can delegate authority, delegate authority, because time is money. And the more time you have um, to actually work on what the big vision is, then you can allow other people to do those things. I'm about to show you why subscriptions are the way of the future. And platforms like YouTube are gonna have creators leave for subscription-based models. How do you explain, what is fan base? Fan base is social media that allows people to give you money for the post that you post. It allows you to put your stuff behind paywalls and charge people for the exact same content that you post on other social media platforms. And that's a, a game changer. Monetizing our content is the wave of the future. It's inevitable. Um, I think that all of you should, should definitely, you know, be excited to monetize your content and know your value and know your worth. Who's on it? Like how many different people are posting and what kind of money are people making versus what they would make on YouTube or Instagram or somewhere else? Most users are making probably anywhere between $100 and $600 a month. And that's a lot for someone that is doing the exact same thing on Instagram that's not famous. This is just the average user and it's built for the centennial generation. I don't feel like Fanbase is a platform that is supposed to fit in with any of the platforms. It's just a space and a place for people to build their own, you know, universe. You'd have to have 1.32 million views a day to get, look how wide it is, maybe 10,000, maybe $158,000 a day. It's pointless on YouTube. How do you guys make money? right now. The convenience of having everybody on the app that already has a payment processor connected to their phone, it's really easy to purchase a subscription with a fingerprint or a face scan, right? Or buy love, which is the virtual currency on Fanbase, where you can buy this virtual currency called love and you tap on photos and you give the user half a penny. And then we take 20% and then pass 50 on to the user of the platform. And that's still a lot. When you think about 5,000 people giving you $2 a month, for a year is $120,000. A lot of people that I know are on social media with millions of followers and can't pay their bills. 
And I think um, the mistake is it is very, very foolish to try to build a business off a following rather than a fan base. Isaac, in your dream world, what would be the next one, two or three things that you would do that would take fan base to a whole different level? I would like us to raise some serious capital. A lot of startups, especially the ones that are not black funded, give massive amounts of funding with having to prove less than what fan base has done. What we have is a proof of concept that actually works. We're generating revenue. We have a user base. And so I think that's the first and foremost thing that we want to do is raise a significant amount of capital to really take it from 200,000 users to 2 million users and to 20 million users and so on and so forth. You know, Isaac, I believe that, and I've, I've seen that in my own experience out here, we're often underfunded and not just slightly, but literally 10, 20 X. And that powerful point you're making about we go way beyond proof of concept and we're still struggling to raise sometimes a 10th of what other people raise. And you kind of say to yourself, that person with a piece of paper or with a PowerPoint slide is raising more than Isaac is with actual people who are paying him money. Yes. Talk to me a little bit about Atlanta because I had an interesting conversation with Malcolm Gladwell where he told me he thought the most interesting city in the world right now is Atlanta. He said, if I was to point to one city that in my mind represents the future of where the world is going, he said Atlanta. Didn't expect to hear that. But in your mind, what's going on? And is Malcolm Gladwell right that Atlanta's at the top of the charts? He absolutely is right. And it's the city that I think for African-American people should be the most protected and defended municipality in the world. The majority of the culture and the ideas from the black community come from Atlanta in this country. Atlanta is a city where you grow up with no ceilings on what you could do. I tell people all the time, there was never anything that I saw in my mind that I felt like I couldn't be because of the color of my skin. And that's an enormous advantage. And that really stems directly from Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up live out the true meaning of its creed. And what Maynard Jackson built as the, the first black mayor of this city, where he took political power and used the system to work on behalf of black people that write legislation that actually is inclusive of black people. We must see the other Atlanta, the one across the tracks. We have the highest concentration of black millionaires in the world. And that's because policy and legislation paved way for that. And so I think it is a city that is so politically aware of the ability and the way that we maintain our culture. We're always fighting for elections to make sure that this amazing place where we're allowed to build our vision and build our dreams stays black led and black inclusive. And a lot of cities don't have that. So Atlanta is absolutely a gem. What do you see in terms of race relations there? In large, Atlanta is a very inclusive community, but there is a small segment, but a very powerful segment of this, this city that has always resented black leadership. Governor, let me just ask you this straight out. Would you say you're a segregationist? Uh, yes, and I believe uh, in my term, or uh, my definition of segregationist, yes, a segregationist is a person that loves his race enough or other races enough has enough of racial pride and integrity to want to preserve them. The new racism in the 2000s is cityhood movements. Some residents of Atlanta's widest and wealthiest district want a divorce from the city, blaming rising crime during the pandemic. White flight where conservatives that didn't want to be under black leadership initially left Atlanta, you know what I'm saying, in the 70s and 80s. And you had them creating all of these cities, Duluth and Alpharetta and Sandy Springs that have their own mayors and they have their own borders and they run things the way that they want to. By large, Atlanta is a very progressive, um, democratic city. But again, there is always that challenge by those that want to take that. They want to strip that inclusive participation of joint venture contracting that Maynard Jack to introduce. Isaac, if you had to live somewhere else, where would you live? Where would be your runner up? I literally never want to live anywhere else. Um, ever be because there's a sense of ownership and pride that comes from living in a city like this. You're looking at a city that has had black mayoral leadership for 60 plus years, and now we're on the verge of having the first black female governor in the country in the same state. We need to be side by side so we can succeed. And so I hope that you will all join us in our fight for the future. Yeah.
I think it's just something that we need to continue to build upon. I don't know any other places in America where you can walk and drive and not feel like a minority. Walk into a restaurant and have people kind of look at you like, do you belong here? So there's no place I'd rather be. Isaac, I want to do a little bit of a rapid fire with you. You mind if we do some rapid fire, hit you with a couple of quick things? No problem. Uh, your favorite athlete of all time? Kobe Bryant. Bryant, the drive! Oh! Kobe Bryant on a rock attack! Uh, favorite musician? Isaac Hayes. Second favorite musician? That's tough. They're all seconds to me. Quincy Jones. Here in the Dr. Dre, Prince. This is what it sounds like. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis and L.A. and Babyface. They're all number two. Love that. Um, Your favorite movie of all time? Probably The Empire Strikes Back. I am your father. If you could have dinner with anyone, dead or alive, who would you love to have dinner with? Probably Martin Luther King. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. If there was one word to describe you, what would that word be? Dreamer. Uh, Isaac, take me out of here uh, with your dad. What's one thing that he taught you that he shared with you that you would pass on to other people? I think just be kind. You know, I I always feel like we are more like our parents by the people that they were than what they taught us. I think the DNA of my father was a person that had a really great soul. And I find myself to this day speaking to people the same way that I saw him speak to people as a child. And I think that is so important is just to be kind and be respectful. Man, I love it. Hey, Isaac, this is a real pleasure, and uh, I hope you'll come back again. Absolutely. We will welcome you down here in Atlanta. Come to the fan base office, and we can definitely hang out and do anything you want to do. Good. Isaac, congratulations, and uh, really nice to meet you. My pleasure. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you very much, man. Hey, hope you enjoyed Isaac Hayes III. What a good guy. Love how at peace he was. Love what he had to say about Atlanta. Love how comfortable he is and what he's building, how grateful he is. And it was so interesting to me that when I asked him what was kind of the turning point moment in his journey, it was meeting the right partner, meeting that chief technology officer, that CTO. Love the idea of good partners and good collaborators. Can't wait till the Carlos Watson Show comes to Atlanta. Hey, hope you're enjoying the show. If you are, remember we got more good ones every weekday. Tune in to us on YouTube. Got good stuff coming your way. See you soon. Yeah.